Hey folks, this is Brian. Um, I did manage to get all my reading done and got my quiz finished. I got 50 out of 50. Yay for me! Uh, so I figured it's, I should begin to bed, but I think I'll do uh, another Fire Horizon update. Although Dylan doesn't have a southern draw like that. Uh, Dylan, personal log, 2001.25. So, the AI here, Gene, is not part of the ship's computer system. Sorry. As we're going through the schematics of the ship and checking things out, it looks like the registry was fabricated. Uh, there's a recording of the ship that's entering the Stargate. Um, before they enter the Stargate, they're being... Uh, chased by a pure earth destroyer it's attempting to intercept them also several other ships uh, and we can go through this through the stargate uh, apparently it's busy the goblin there are explosions um, and then the goblins on the other side uh, and then they continue to to hear uh, we're able to find out that the Roseon sector stargate is in fact controlled by the Corellian in uh, through some more discussions with with uh, Robin and the AI, well actually with Jean the AI here because she's been here for a long time that this Roseon culture believes that if they expose themselves before the prophecy that will interfere with the prophecy uh, that relates to the appearance of a threat and if if they can pass this threat, then that will ease their way into the Golden Age. Anyway, out in the cave here, uh, where the ships are connected, the cave, are actually cave writings of the, the prophecy. As we're going about doing ship repairs kind of stuff, because we actually have repair stuff on our, sh on our ship to help us with this lost cruiser if we ever find it. <clears throat> and so we've actually got enough parts, we think, to get both ships up and running. So we're working on the goblin here. As we're doing that, we can tell that the ship's computer, nor any other system on the ship, is capable of harboring an AI. So we talk with Gene, try and find out what's going on. Um, it turns out that Jean was the captain of the Goblin, and she was a Scion, and she and the AI merged through some kind of Forerunner device, and that's where they are currently. This gives me the eebie-jeebies, and while we're doing all this discussion and seeing things, I get sucked into some kind of psionic experience where I'm standing in a park by a lake and there's Jean and there's a little girl behind her holding onto her leg, kind of peeking out. She smiles at me, but then she runs off. Got frightened or something. Rex tells Jean about his vision of the geode AI. You know, the praying mantis and the fighting goose stuff. And through this, I, I realized that this giant black praying mantis thing that I was terrified of at, at, the, uh, at the mine was, in fact, just a manifestation of the goo. The goo was manifesting stuff as this giant praying mantis. Gene explains to us that down below, at the bottom, uh, well, at the city, at the bottom of the skyscraper we're on is this thing called the path of light and that, that may give us some answers to what we're looking for so I think it's Balthasar and I we head off and to go talk with the seer and I just kind of say hey this is what we think this is what we know 
we're thinking maybe we should. What do you think? And dealing with this whole, you know, path of light for the uh, off-wielders, part of the prophecy kind of thing. I kind of feel like maybe we really need to do something here to help fulfill this prophecy. You know, that, that's why we're here. She doesn't really give us much of a good answer. Um, but she seems very interested in us doing this. Balthasar also gets permission to get blood samples from people in the village. But she goes about doing it. They have no blood samples. This whole part of this, you know, where do these people come from? DNA kind of stuff and that kind of deal. Okay, so we go and we invite the warrior that lost his fight with Rex to come down with us so he can show us the way to our guy. And that way he can get down there and make himself a new sword. <clears throat> as, as we are doing that, we tell him about the gigantic lizard, he tells us. But that's just a legend. He's a ghost. Anyway, we threw the ship into the, into the skyscraper. Um, down the stairs, down the stairs, down the stairs, down the stairs. Um, come across some hallways. We go across into another uh, skyscraper. Um, we go across into a third one. We go across to the middle. Maybe it was like a uh, four-dimensional with the hollow thing in the middle kind of deal. Anyway, we get to another skyscraper. And this one. The side of the building is actually exposed to the cavernous area underground here. <clears throat> we actually have to go down the outside. So uh, he was going to rappel down, strap on the contragrav, and, and carry him down. Uh, down the bottom is a subway system. He warns us that there are spider-like creatures down here that eat the lizards. That's how big they are, right? Um, we start going down the tunnel, and sure enough, it's one of these arachnid things. I popped him with my gauss rifle. It was great. Uh, further down the subway, we get to where the subway train is. It's crashed or whatever. And uh, there's a breach in the wall. This, this fissure within the bedrock itself. So we go through that. It opens into a large chamber, which is some kind of a control room. Um, seems to be a bug fusion power plant and it's attached to a fusion generator because we're breaking the floor here and on the opposite side the fissure continues um, he tells us through there is what you seek he says when you step on the golden pool do not stop until you get to the other side and then uh, he sits down to go about making his new sword um, he opens up a panel, and he takes out these two tentacles and attaches it to his head. <laughs> and we can hear stuff whining inside the machinery. <clears throat> anyway, we go through the fissure. Um, eventually, it opens up into a natural cavern, but there's no other entrance to this place. And in the center is this black, glassy surface. Etched in the surface is a meandering trail, golden light, plus there's a disc, a golden disc. When we come out the black surface, there's a golden disc there. And coming out is like a stream or a golden stream that just wanders around all across this black thing. We can identify five, maybe, what looked to have been, may have been at one point bodies that are just turned to dust by this point and have been blown, like to the edge of this glassy surface. Oh, uh, so we, we try at this point to try and commune with Maliki to see if maybe she can give us some guidance on, on whether or not we should do this, and if so, how? Uh, Balthasar decides to invoke um, one of his sonic powers. When he does that, his psychic energy is pulled out of him. He goes into the golden circle and then spins down the streamer like a piece of light. So he sits down, he's going to take a nap and relax a bit. While he's out, I say, okay, I think we're supposed to acquire this prophecy. I think we need to do this, so I'll do it. So I step on the golden disc, and uh, I can 
I can smell almonds. I'm not sure what that means or anything. And I can feel like someone's watching me. Um, and I can I can tell there are 12 veils that I'll need to get through to get to the end. Um, every once in a while I hit hit one of these veils, I can feel it as I push through, and it wipes me out. In fact, when I get through the very last one, I think I'm going to die, and I collapse, unconscious, and so on. A couple things dealing with this. Um, for, for myself, one of the one of the mechanics that I I do and play, um, uh, I think I picked up from Pendragon on. Uh, Developing passions. So what uh, I do is I roll three d six, and that's um, a difficulty scale. It's actually an easy scale. The higher the number, the easier it is, kind of thing. And then I roll d twenty to see, okay, how was the result um, for this whole gene and the AI being one thing and the forerunner device, creepy stuff, right? Um, I rolled a fifteen and I rolled a fifteen, so I'm I don't like this, but I'm not totally freaked out. Um, the idea is the higher roll in a d20 above the 3d6 number, the more severe the reaction kind of thing. That, at least that's how I do it. Um, what else we got here? Other stuff. Again, we know about this this black black goo stuff. Is part of this invisible sun. They consume the light. Um, the insect guy on the platform of the geode uh, was a member of the praying mantis, praying mantis race. They are the iron wind. Um, honestly, I have no idea how we actually know this, but it's in my notes. Um, oh, the mechanics of going through the 12 veils thing. The, the GM took uh, hit points, fatigue, Power, um, I think that was the three things he took. And then as we're going through, every time we hit one of these veils, um, you have to make percentile rolls. And then based upon whether or not we make or miss the designated number, we lose a certain die worth of something. Uh, my first time was a D4, second was a D10, third was a D4, another D10, a D10, a D10, a D12, a D12, a D8, a D8, then the D20. I mean, that's when I thought, okay, look, I'm dead. <laughs> and then uh, a final D8. But I lost two points, then one, then two, then nine, then one, then four, then four, then 12. That D12 rolled a 12. Then two, then four, then 16 on that D20. And then my final was a four. And so I was kind of tracking uh, total of values. The, the die roll was the type of dice, the actual number I rolled on a die, and then cumulative totals as it went along. Um, and then trying to track, you know, which one is going on. So it's going on. I felt pretty good in the, when we hit that end. And I rolled a 99 going through veil number 11. Uh, okay, that's it. I'm dead. I'm going to survive this. I'm going to die. Um, but I was unconscious um, with the last veil, and they, they pulled me off. So I didn't die. Um, I had to pop out, not early, because I just shut out early. Everybody else is in Washington State, Seattle area, except for me. I'm out here in Virginia. So it comes midnight. I turn to a pumpkin. I need to go. But they keep playing because it's only like 9 o'clock there. Right? At least they used to. <clears throat> so I turn find out that uh, Balthazar, Haas, Rex, um, and Tindo all made it. Uh, Robin didn't even try. So that was that scenario, or that 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 phase of the scenario, that adventure, that beginning.